Thank you very much, Professor Gould. Thanks for the invitation. And thanks to you all for coming here. It's, uh, it's great to be here. And it's great to um, try out the ideas as a whole uh, in this book, which has been a, a long project, but a, a real labor of love. Um, uh, on the way, as you'll see, I, um, I really learned to appreciate an Indian thinker who only now is becoming um, highly recognized, uh, B.R. Ambedkar, and I'll talk about him a little bit today and how he's influenced my thinking on possibilities for um, enhancing input and exchange and mechanisms of challenge beyond the state in service of rights advancement, rights specification. So it's a very instrumental take on, uh, on these sorts of things. And it's, it's interesting, while I'm often associated with um, global democracy literatures, uh, this is actually the first time that I've squarely tried to make uh, arguments about democracy in the, uh, in the trade state context. So before I've talked about it, but I haven't really tried to lay out what it was. So today I will uh, offer a brief overview of the book first, and then I'll focus on um, sort of the heart of the book, which are the arrogance critiques of cosmopolitanism. And I will look at uh, possible responses drawing on um, Bedkar's own take on uh, political humility. He didn't call it that, but that's essentially what he's talking about. And then I'll look at political humility as it might be advanced by institutional global citizenship, the idea being that the um, answer to the critiques of cosmopolitanism as arrogant, as um, neo-imperialistic, is actually more cosmopolitanism, uh, which is, it seems a little counterintuitive. Hopefully I can make a persuasive case for that. And then I'll look at um, a case study where I, am, uh, I, I went to India many times uh, to interview people who were engaging the United Nations human rights regime to press for action against their own government on caste discrimination. They were very much inspired by Ambedkar's legacy and uh, his own global outreach. And, uh, and I turned to them for insights on how this model might work, how this model might be advanced, this multi-level model of employee challenge. And then I talk about some of the implications of the argument. I'm afraid I don't have an answer for um, what to do about the recession of democracy globally in the current climate, but uh, thankfully we've got uh, another book we can write on this. So, the book works to show how some long-standing diversity objections against a cosmopolitan moral approach could be addressed, in part by adopting an, in, an appropriately configured institutional cosmopolitanism. Um, and in getting toward what I would, uh, what I argue is an appropriately configured such approach, it draws centrally on the work of B.R. Ambedkar, uh, Bhimrao Ramji Ambedkar, who was um, probably the best known Indian anti-caste campaigner. A lot of people know about um, Mahatma Gandhi's uh, work against untouchability. Uh, he and Ambedkar were actually rivals. Ambedkar argued for the full annihilation of, of caste, which was the title of his most famous work, his uh, speech that's now available as a book in a really nice uh, annotated volume. Um, and I draw on, on him to uh, really think, think this argument through. He died in 1956, and the Constitution uh, came into effect in 1950, which he was, he was centrally involved in the drafting of that. So just some definitions to start with. Moral cosmopolitanism, I'm, I'm dealing with a standard sort of uh, liberal cosmopolitan definition. I don't try to um, say too much about that in the book or, or advance that in the much. Uh, seeks to give the interests of all persons due equal weight. There is no fundamental moral significance to state, national, or group belonging. So I, I work with a fairly robust conception of cosmopolitanism. It would grant uh, that there are special duties to intimates, to our children, um, but it, when it comes to sort of the more impersonal relationships that we have with co-nationals, uh, I would argue that special duties are harder to justify, special duties to compatriots, especially if they're thought to be categorical and very, very strong, such that you, you can exclude all outsiders. Institutional cosmopolitanism, the uh, variant I tend to work with, supports the development of robustly empowered regional, ultimately global institutions to advance aims for rights fulfillment uh, or needs or capabilities. I tend to work in the rights framework. And as the construction would indicate, uh, I work with a, uh, a primarily instrumental approach to institutional cosmopolitanism. Uh, political institutions serve a purpose. That purpose primarily is rights protection, rights fulfillment, but also the equitable specification of the rights that we have. 
uh, and I'm institutional health and health principle for me looks to extend that to the regional and ultimately the global level in whichever ways are feasible. Okay, so arrogance critiques. People tend to have this guy in mind, Immanuel Kant, uh, when they're thinking about these sorts of critiques. And uh, often you'll find critics talking about Kantian cosmopolitanism. So he's, he's a bit of a stand-in. Um, I don't spend a lot of time talking about Kant, but certainly he's in the book. Um, but cosmopolitanism is said to be arrogant toward those whose moral views are shaped by particular non-universal attachments. It inappropriately rejects as not authorized any claims for particular duties to others grounded in such views. And for this kind of critique, we can look to Martha Nussbaum, who is still associated by uh, possibly even most people uh, associated strongly with cosmopolitanism because in the mid-90s she had some very forceful statements about why cosmopol moral cosmopolitanism is the right stance to take, um, but she pulled back considerably later on and is now a, um, a pretty uh, strong and forceful critic of stoic cosmopolitanism, the classical variant that she was defending earlier on. So she makes these sorts of, uh, of arguments, and I engage with her in the book at some length um, because her work is still that important. Cosmopolitanism is arrogant in the second sense, the critics would say, in implicitly treating those holding non-Western moral views as not qualified to offer input or moral claims. This is the neo-imperialism critique, uh, which is married to this uh, secondary claim that it seeks to impose on persons in post-colonial societies, let's say, parochial Western moral views disguised as neutral universal ones. So it's either um, a Kantian Westernism, or it's Christianity dressed up as cosmopolitanism, um, etc. So in addressing the critiques, I turn to Ambedkar first and throughout the book. He championed universal principles of equality and rights, striving to transform a domestic system which was oriented to segregation, exclusion, and what he called the arrogance of caste. And that's in that book I mentioned, The Annihilation of Caste, 1936. He, in response, he prescribed relatively strongly empowered democratic political institutions to advance forms of political humility. Now, again, he didn't call it that, but he um, called it a few things over the course of his career. Same basic set of ideas, calling for dispositions of inclusion, um, of equality, recognition of equality, and of a democracy which would fully recognize the standing of the other moral and political standing. So first I turn to humility as it's been defined, because uh, humility still has strong connotations for many people, especially if they're engaging with Christian traditions of servility, of deference in the face of, of competing moral claims. Uh, for Ambedkar, humility was the stance expected of Dalits like him. So he was born into a Mahar Dalit family, the people formerly called untouchables. And um, he uh, rejects very forcefully this idea that Dalits should be subservient. They should be humble in the face of their social superiors in the caste system, the Hindu caste system. And uh, he demands equal recognition, equal treatment in various ways. So I look at uh, what psychologists and moral philosophers are saying about humility these days, and they tend to um, coalesce on a few key claims. So humility is not construed necessarily as subservience, subservience plain deference in the face of competing claims. It's um, pretty consistently recognition of the equal moral standing of others, an openness to input and challenge from them. So the person adopting a disposition, disposition of humility um, takes turns, says what they have to say, and listens to what the other person has to say, and treats it as something that's potentially significant and worth listening to. And then this person, the, part of this disposition would be an epistemic modesty about the finality of the judgments that we can make, a, a, a sense that we might be able to be proved wrong, that uh, just because we said it doesn't make it right. Arrogance is essentially the rejection of each such figure or feature. You don't take turns, you don't listen to others, you don't engage in exchange. Uh, you might be aloof, you might think that you're superior, you might not think that you're superior, uh, you just don't take input. Um, and there are other vices that are related to it as well. Recalcitrance is one that figures in the book. And that's where um, you don't, uh, you listen very carefully to the other person, and then you go and do what you're going to do anyway. Okay, as we all did with our dissertation supervisors. Right? <laughs> Political humility, 
uh, recognition of the equal standing of others to offer input, challenge, and make claims in a political context. So this is moral standing becomes recognized political standing. Pretty familiar, the equal political standing that's at the heart of most uh, conceptions of democracy. Um, Becker thought each could be promoted through the establishment of democratic political institutions, formally recognizing equal citizen standing. And this was a fairly radical claim for the time in which he was working, that Dalit should be recognized as full political equals um, and should be listened to, should be heard. Um, it's not identical to democratic citizenship, though. As Abed Carroll was very clear, you can still see political arrogance, you can see recalcitrance, uh, other political vices, and I think these vices are really masterfully uh, investigated by Mark Button in this uh, 2016 book called Political Vices. And so I've, I've leaned on that as sort of um, to, to lay the foundations of some of my analysis. So I highly recommend that if you're interested in the topic. So Ambedkar's dispositions of uh, political humility in, in early writings and uh, really throughout, he was um, prone to talk in terms of fraternity. Uh, and uh, he was uh, you know, writing in the first half of the 20th century, so he was using uh, men as the universal person and that sort of thing, um, consistent with the standards of the time. But he was also talking about women's equality. Uh, I think that's uh, useful to point out, and Martha Nussbaum has written on uh, those aspects of his work recently. He actually resigned as the first law minister from Nehru's cabinet in 1951 over issues of women's equality and marriage. But um, when he spoke in terms of the first sort of disposition to inclusion, disposition to political humility, he was talking about fraternity. And in the Indian Constitution, you can still see the preamble, it adopts the uh, French Revolution triad, fraternity, uh, liberty, and equality, uh, with Ambedkar's own take on how those might be interpreted in the Indian context. Later on, he, he spoke about social endosmosis um, of the 40s. Yes? I know you're visiting New York, but you don't have to talk as fast as we do. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit that out later. But um, I'm actually just a little bit slower. OK. So, social endosmosis was uh, a term that he adapted from Dewey's work, and he, he wrote quite a lot about this. The um, takeaway on this is that it's inclusion, fluid movement among societal groups. So endosmosis is a uh, biological term about the movement of water through cells. Uh, Dewey spoke about that just once, just made an offhand comment about it, about wanting to promote endosmosis socially within a democracy, and Ambedkar really seized on that. He had studied with Dewey just up the road here at Columbia. He did his PhD at Columbia. And, um, and really liked that idea and adapted it um, and extended it for the Indian context. Later on, as Ambedkar began looking for a social alternative to Hinduism, because still very much in India you're defined by your religious affiliation. So it, it really wasn't an option for him, at least the way he was looking at things, to think about having no religion, to, to telling Dalits they should reject all religion. He turned to Buddhism as the most appropriate religion. For him, it was the religion that most appropriately recognized the innate moral equality of human beings. And from Buddhist uh, doctrine, he took this idea of Maitri, and as he always did, adapted it, adopted it for the political context, uh, as he developed his own strain of Navayana Buddhism. And this Maitri is a virtue expressing sympathy amity, benevolence toward others, including animals. So it's actually uh, a really interesting concept to work with when you think of uh, these days some of the debates around dignity and whether that excludes animals from having any moral value, any moral status. And Ambedkar was very explicit that animals should be included in the circles of sympathy uh, in his later writings. Okay. So I take insights from those. I tend to speak in terms of political humility, but I keep coming back to the way Ambedkar spoke about it, because he spoke very eloquently about how these things might be operationalized in a democracy. But this brings me to the central claim of the book, that an institutional cosmopolitanism, giving due emphasis to global citizenship, to this sort of equal citizenship Ambedkar's talking about, but extended um, across the, the boundaries of the nation state, would actually be systema systemically oriented to political humility. It, uh, it would, it, the institutional variance arrogance, if you like, would not be intensified in the way that uh, some critics, notably Bernard Yack and David Miller, have argued. They've said, if you, boy, if you don't like cosmopolitanism, wait till you see institutional cosmopolitanism, because that's, 
That's many times worse. Um, it would uh, simply reinforce all the tendencies to arrogance. And, and my claim is, is the uh, counter of that, that this would actually be a way to address uh, what are, I think, some significant critiques, the arrogance critiques. And this is first because in establishing or expanding practices of regional and global citizenship, it would enable more robust challenges to the political arrogance inherent to a system of sovereign states. And I've, um, if you're interested in those claims, I've published an article called On Cosmopolitan Humility and the Arrogance of States, which lays out the, um, the claims there in some detail. They're, they're in the book as well, but if you're interested in looking those up. But the short version is that um, state, the state system is arrogant because states are designated the primary guarantors of universal individual rights, but they also have the authority to summarily dismiss input or challenge on those same rights claims. And this sets up a, a tension that I don't think is resolvable in the state system. And it means that when states do summarily dismiss these claims, they're inappropriately rejecting the input. They should be taking this input as the designated guarantors of rights of their own populations, but also uh, rights within the system more broadly. Uh, but the system itself authorizes them to summarily dismiss these claims, and they often do. So I'll give some examples from field work. Uh, so you'll see both vertical and horizontal dismissals. The big case study was the national campaign on Dalit human rights. I'll talk about that. I spent a lot of time interviewing those folks uh, from about 2010 to 2016 with a few follow-ups after that to see their, um, to get their insights on these kind of dynamics. So, but an example um, would be of uh, horizontal arrogance where in Australia you've had, a, you've got a continuing policy of uh, any time a boat loaded with asylum seekers is trying to reach Australian shores as was, as was common earlier in, uh, in the century. Um, the Australian government has adopted a policy now under both parties to intercept the boats and take them to an offshore facility, uh, Manus Island, there's been one on Nauru, where they're held. Um, and what they're told is, if you try to reach Australia by boat, you will never be settled here as a refugee. Um, we will not take you, we will not process you, we will hold you until someone else takes you, or you agree to go back to where you came from. And the UN Special Rapporteur uh, it came at one point when Tony Abbott was Prime Minister and investigated the conditions on Manus Island and found that they were in violation of the UN Convention Against Torture and said, you know, the conditions under which people are being held are not reasonable. They are, they're, in, they're in violation, they're, they're very poor, and Australia needs to change this. Now, Tony Abbott could have said, thank you for the input. Uh, we are signatories to that convention. We will see what we can do about this. Um, you know, we, we want to be, we want to honor the obligations we bound ourselves to as a nation state. But instead, what he did was exercise the right to summarily dismiss. So he says, all of the basic needs or the conditions on Manus, this is a quotation, the conditions on Manus Island are reasonable under all the circumstances, basic needs of the people are being met. The UN would be much better served by giving credit to the Australian government for what's been achieved in terms of stopping the boats. And he said some other things characteristic of his, his uh, governance style, you know, basically saying the UN should just stay out of our business. Um, now, you might say, well, that's just Tony Abbott being Tony Abbott, but, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to scratch the surface very hard to find many, many examples of states telling the UN to stay out of their business, telling the special rapporteurs, telling the, the you know, the universal periodic review process um, that um, they're going to not act on um, some of the issues that have been raised, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what Abbott is doing is invoking norms of sovereignty to cut off critical input from the special rapporteur, from the person tasked with oversight of state actions, and reinforce the country's standing as the ultimate judge in its own case. So every state in the current system, of course, has the right to claim to be the ultimate judge in its own case. If they want to, they can pull out the treaties altogether. In the extreme uh, case, of course, humanitarian intervention is a possibility, uh, but it is rare in the system still, uh, relatively speaking. So the claim is that such actions and understandings exemplify this arrogance of state sovereignty, moves to invoke prerogatives of sovereignty in place of justification and exchange, um, and they're, they're not tied necessarily to specific arrogant leaders. Tony Abbott's rhetoric might have been harsher than many other leaders, but the structure of the system is conducive to this kind of action. 
to, to uh, have rooted its overwhelming interest to the priority of one's own population. Okay, so institutional global citizenship would in part aim to challenge this inherent arrogance of the state system by developing over time some concrete elements of equal global citizenship. And again, I take an instrumental view, so um, if we can't have a global constitutional convention in the next five years, which I'm not sure would be a good idea at this point, uh, we can certainly make progress in other ways, and I'll, I'll indicate some of the ways. But the, uh, the long-term aim is to advance elements, concrete elements of equal global citizenship, more democ uh, democratically accountable regional, and ultimately global political institutions, including formal mechanisms of equal challenge, so ombuds, uh, more oversight mechanisms, uh, eventually legal mechanisms. You know, the European Union, some other, some other regional court systems have uh, fairly well-developed legal mechanisms. They don't always have a lot of teeth, but certainly the statutes are there, the treaties. Each would help to orient the system to political humility. They would also help to expand input on rights and diverse moral understandings for those who are largely excluded from current power structures. So I'll come back to that claim, but the idea being that um, if you are one of these Dalit activists, you often find that it's very hard to get uh, what you would consider a full and appropriate hearing in your domestic context. Uh, so the um, global context, the, uh, the establishment of venues in which you can have a hearing on a more equal basis, where your equal standing is recognized to give input, to offer challenges, would be an advance on the current system and would help to challenge its any areas. Okay. So insights again from the model taken from field research among present-day Dalit activists who contested the Indian government's action on caste discrimination through the UN Human's right, Human Rights Regime. And um, this is long-standing. It goes all the way back to Ambedkar, who in the 1940s saw W.E.B. Du Bois and the uh, NAACP approaching the United Nations and saying, look, we've got exhaustive documentation of the, um, the abuse and the violence and the killing of African Americans. And we're going to present this to the United Nations and we're going to issue an appeal to the world, a call to action to help us pressure the United States government to do a lot more about these sorts of things. And Ambedkar was, uh, was very interested in that. He wrote to Du Bois, he said, wow, can you, can you send me a copy of your petition? You know, it was 1946, so he couldn't just sing it by, uh, by email. And Du Bois wrote back saying, oh yes, I've heard about your work too, and I'm very interested, I'll certainly send you a copy. Um, and as far as we know, that's the only correspondence they had. But Ambedkar um, prepared his own report, and he was, he was um, a uh, trained economist, trained uh, political scientist, if you like, as well, and was very good at compiling statistics. So he mentions that he had compiled a large report. It seems to have been lost uh, with a lot of his papers. But uh, he said, I chose not to uh, present that report to the United Nations when it became clear that we were going to be able to write our own constitution. And Nehru, um, recognizing his standing as a great legal mind in uh, Indian society, tapped him to be the chair of the Constitutional Drafting Committee, uh, where he was able to put a lot of the ideas that he'd been talking about all these years into the constitution. So, Untouchability practices were formally barred. Um, equal citizenship with a charter of fundamental rights. The, the kinds of things that Ambedkar thought were very important that Gandhi, his rival, did not. Um, Gandhi did not want a strongly empowered central government. So if you like, Ambedkar won that round. He had lost to Gandhi in one of the previous things. So the case study looks at Dalit activists who since the 80s have been trying to um, reach out themselves to the, to the UN human rights regime, to some of the big uh, NGOs, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, trying to get enlist them in their struggle and get them on their side. And finally, in the 90s, they were able to get Human Rights Watch to commit um, to, a major, um, to a major effort. And that was actually led by uh, Smita Narula, who is still in this city. Is she in the... Uh... Yes, she just uh, ended her. Um, as okay. running our human rights program at Hunter. Uh, so a very impressive person. Okay. Yeah. So since the late 1990s, NCDHR, the National Campaign on Dalit Human Rights, has been enlisting the UN Human Rights Bodies, the European Parliament, U.S. Congress. Congress has passed several res resolutions, so has the Parliament, the, the EP, as allies in pressing the Indian government on caste discrimination. 
So they've tried to enact this multi-level model. It's like a boomerang model when they reach out horizontally to the NGOs, but it also becomes a vertical model when they reach out vertically to the United Nations Human Rights Regime. And they say, look, India is a signatory to the Discrimination Convention. Let's see if we can get an interpretation that says it should have included, uh, it should be understood to include caste discrimination and not just discrimination by racial descent. That was a big part of their struggle uh, from about 1998. So they raised awareness significantly. There was the uh, Durban Anti-Racism Conference in 2001, Durban, South Africa, and they brought by far the largest delegation of any group. They brought 200 Dalit activists to Durban, and they, they brought their drums, and they were beating drums, and, and just going up to anyone they could find and telling them about what, what you know, their concerns about what was happening domestically in India. Uh, they went to all the state delegates, uh, any UN delegates they could find, all the uh, sort of horizontal potential allies, and they were just very, very proactive. And they succeeded in raising awareness quite a bit. Um, but the Indian government pushed back. So I spoke to uh, one of the UN officials who'd actually been involved in these negotiations. So the, the Dalit activists had initially had 14 states willing to sign on and say, yes, we think caste, it should be interpreted uh, to explicitly include caste. Caste comes under this. And India's uh, own diplomats went to work, and by the time the actual uh, hearing came about, when they were going to vote on this, all but Switzerland, somehow Switzerland, had dropped out. Um, and so, as often happens in these cases, the state puts up very, very vigorous resistance when it sees the possibility that it won't be able to be the ultimate judge in some case, or state leaders. So the same thing happened with um, the notable African-American efforts. So the NAACP got huge pushback from the U.S. government. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, all felt like she uh, you know, told them, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to quit uh, being a member of your board if, uh, if you keep this up because you're giving the Soviet Union too much ammunition. Etc. Etc. These these patterns tend to repeat themselves. So that's kind of where we are now. Um, so the case studies are part of the grounded normative theory method that's central to this book, and that's what I'm calling it these days. Just uh, following Brooke accurately. So it takes some she gave insights. Talk here too, by the way. Sorry. Oh, she gave her talk. great, great. Um, so we'll be doing a symposium on her book at uh, the International Studies Association conference. If any of you are going to that, I encourage you. to to come see that. It's called Just Responsibility. It came up um, not too long ago, and, and it's uh, grounded normative theory is central to her book. It's central to this one and to the previous Global Citizenship book I did. So the basic idea is when you want to make normative arguments about a, uh, a, a context, it's, uh, it, as far as you can, it's really helpful to go to the context and talk to the people who are making specific kinds of normative claims. So for the global citizenship book, my case studies were primarily immigration and battles over unauthorized immigration. So I spent a lot of time on the U.S.-Mexico border. I was working in Arizona then, and a good bit of time in the European migration context, looking at the migrants coming from North Africa, and speaking to the migrants about you know, their justifications for what they were doing, what, how they viewed what they were doing, speaking to the civilian border patrollers, strapping on pistols, going there to report migrants, sometimes to apprehend them uh, privately, that sort of thing. And I felt like it gave me a lot of insight. It helped me avoid some easily avoidable mistakes that I otherwise might have made. And um, so the same thing with this. I really wanted to speak to um, the National Campaign on Dalit Human Rights. You know, they were, they had gotten a lot of attention. I would seen stories in the New York Times and other places. And I said, wow, this sounds like a group that might be really useful in terms of thinking through some of these diversity critiques because they're um, making their claims in the language of human rights, which is interesting. I'd like to know how that came about. And I'd like to know the kind of pushback they might get on that language, which is often uh, resisted by governments in post-colonial societies, by others in their society. And I'd like to know what the government thinks about what they're doing. And I'd like to know their claims for the justifiability of jumping over, if you like, the domestic sphere and going to the global sphere. So these were the reasons I went to India 16 times um, in that period, and also to, to do some work for my university. But um, interviewed activists all around the country, BJP officials who are, who are the ruling party. At that time, they were out of power, but about to come back into power. Uh, 
and seeking their own claims about the global outreach. So this is fairly typical. You have an NCDHR activist, this one is in South India, uh, when they it noted that when the campaign began, so they started with a huge uh, signature drive and um, a lot of documentation in the way that Ambedkar taught them uh, of abuses that they brought to the UN human rights bodies. They were told by government officials, quote, you're exposing the very ill side of India before others. You're humiliating us. And the activists respond, but we used to say, already we're humiliated for 3,000 years. And this was a consistent theme, so there was a lot of talk about dirty laundry. The, um, the activists would say, the government always pushes us. They say, you're airing the dirty laundry, you're being disloyal, you're making India look bad on the global stage. And they would say, well, that's, it, it needs to um, look a little bad on these issues because these are very important issues that we're trying to suppress discussion on that could help us advance solutions. Um, when I spoke to the BJP, some of them were very forceful indeed. So he was foreign minister um, around the time uh, the campaign first started in the very late 90s. And uh, this was his comment. He's, he's known for sort of um, provocative rhetoric. So this is the sort of thing he says. But the sentiment is not at all unusual among these subjects. And I spoke to about 24 mid-level and senior level officials. So the former foreign minister says, of the activists, so I said, so, you know, I start with the innocuous question, so National Campaign on Dalit Human Rights, um, what's your impression of the work they were doing trying to get the UN involved more on the caste issues? And you know, he jumped right in and said they should have been sent to Guantanamo, um, you know, sort of ironically. Uh, but anyone who doesn't believe in the sovereignty of India doesn't deserve to live here. And that was a consistent theme, sometimes expressed more gently by the BJP, but they would say, you know, we're a democracy, we've got institutions that can deal with this issue, and they should be, uh, be bringing it to us. You know, if, if someone's being oppressed in my society, I want to know, and I'll take care of them. And of course, the, the Dalit activists would respond, uh, you have the opportunity to take care of us as we've been bringing these demands to you for decades, if not thousands of years, um, and, it, and it really, we're not making the kind of progress that needs to be made, so it's important to take it at, uh, globally. Okay, and some of the things, the BJP's, uh, a right-wing nationalist party, uh, arguably it's also a right-wing populist party, it could be comparatively studied with those, uh, and they've got a very firm idea that India should be a Hindu, um, uh, arranged around a Hindu nationalism. And uh, Hin Hindus are about 80% of the population still, and uh, the BJP believes that, uh, for the most part, that others should simply conform to uh, Hindu views, to Hindu practices. So for example, they shouldn't be eating beef. And you've seen a lot more beef bans in various states. Um, and this affects Dalits because traditionally they were forced into the occupation of dragging the dead animal carcasses. So when the cow dies in the street, uh, the Dalits are expected to drag it away and uh, dispose of it. Um, and they were uh, that was uh, one of the food sources they were allowed to eat, so they, they traditionally began, they, they were traditionally beef eaters, and so you've had instances of Dalits being um, stopped when they were, you know, taking uh, cows to slaughter, or even um, animals that aren't cows, that are like they're bovine, but they're not technically cows, and, you know, beaten with rods, killed, there have been dozens of deaths over cow protection uh, by vigilantes. And the BJP itself has denied foreign funding for about 20,000 NGOs. There are only about 40,000 registered NGOs, but um, it's really taken some proactive steps to deny them foreign funding because it looks at them as meddling in Indian domestic politics in ways they should. So there's that theme again. Um, and NCDHR and, all, and virtually all the other groups I've spoke to have had to go to court to try to protect their ability to receive foreign funding. So what have I learned from the case? Um, well, the activists have sought to give input and lodge challenges beyond the state through the UN system. They've highlighted the potential importance of such mechanisms for contesting domestic injustice and ways in which the system is conducive to forms of political arrogance you can see in some of the moves that have been made. And they've also acted as institutionally developmental global citizen agents. And I think this goes a little bit beyond um, norm diffusion, norm implementation, to highlighting ways in which uh, the system we've got isn't quite equal to the tasks that have been ascribed to it. So the, the advance, the protection, the, specif the further specification of human rights. And one of the things the Dalit activists' actions do is highlight gaps between uh, 
the institutions we have globally and possibly the institutions we need. Now, um, I will clarify that this is not one of their, this is not an official position for uh, the campaign. In fact, the uh, convener of the campaign, Paul DeVocker, who I've spoken to a number of times, uh, was very concerned that I not associate the campaign with any sort of uh, call for global democracy. And I'm, I'm pretty clear in the book to try to distinguish that. Now, a couple of people do say, yeah, it would be great if the UN had, the, had some real teeth, um, were able really to, to you know, offer meaningful sanctions or other pressure on India to make it actually comply. Um, but most of them did not want to go there because what they're doing is radical enough as it is. And, they, and uh, even if they supported that, they didn't want to take it on. But for my analysis, what they're doing is highlighting gaps between the institutions we have that are tasked with doing certain things and their actual ability to do those things. Okay. And other insights, um, one of the insights uh, I took away was that these concerns about neo-imperialism are, are living concerns. They're very real and often they're very meaningful and significant. Um, I was uh, blown away, I have to say, uh, not to get too technical about it, but when I went to uh, this building the uh, Central Secretariat. So this is near the, uh, this is the governing complex in uh, the capital, New Delhi. And uh, the complex was built in the uh, early part of the 20th century by the decree of the king at the time, and when he visited India for the first time. And when um, the British thought that India would be the crown jewel of their overseas possessions for many, many years to come. So he decreed that a grand capital be built. And this is one of, the, um, one of the buildings that was central to it. It's sort of a melange of Indian styles and neoclassical styles. But here, over this massive doorway, is an inscription that was put there by one of the architects, not Luton's, but the, uh, the guy who uh, co-designed a lot of these buildings with him. And the inscription says, liberty will not descend to a people. A people must raise themselves to liberty. It is a blessing that must be earned before it can be enjoyed. And imagine the context of 1920s imperial India and um, the idea that uh, they, they felt like they needed to put this in raised gold lettering all around this doorway. And that gives a sense of how the BJP would view any attempt by outsiders to try to, uh, as, they would, as they would see it, to try to tell them what to do, to try to tell them how to govern, etc. cetera. Um, and they don't much like being told by insiders either. But uh, they, would, they would claim, and global allies, that NCDHR is seeking to break India, allying with Christian groups, a lot of Dalits. Um, Buddhism did not, uh, Ambedkar led 300,000 followers in a massive ceremony of conversion to Buddhism, uh, Dalits. But today there are many more Dalit Christians uh, than Dalit Buddhists, and I think that's because he died soon afterwards, so he didn't really have a chance to institutionalize it. Um, and some of the missionary groups have been very active. But um, the BJP sees it as attempts to break India. They see NCDHR as very much aligned with those. So there's a national best-selling book that the Prime Minister Modi has uh, written an endorsement for that is called Breaking India. And it's all about what these groups are conspiring to do. So for them, it's, it's just of a piece with uh, Cotton's inscription there. Um, and so they think that uh, post-colonial states such as India are being treated as not qualified to offer input or moral claims. And I think that's something very significant that the cosmopolitan really needs to be aware of because it does have its roots in some very dubious um, sort of imperialist claims uh, or hierarchical racialized claims by Kant and Mill and some of the others who uh, cosmopolitans look to for inspiration, not so much Mill, but certainly Kant. Um, so what are the responses? Well, one of the responses to the first critique the, uh, the idea that cosmopolitanism doesn't give enough um, space for the importance of cultural attachments, cultural um, views, is that uh, advancing elements of global citizenship should enable more robust challenges to moral parochialism. Excuse me, this is neo-imperialism. Moral parochialism in many guises. So you've got neo-imperialism, uh, you know, if... Um, if some of these groups really are wanting to impose their own views on India, you've got internal, internal parochialism, which has been resisted for a long time. Gandhi was shot by a Hindu nationalist who was central to some of the efforts um, at that time. 
and uh, the uh, one of the groups, uh, social groups, centrally affiliated with the BJP was banned for almost two years after Gandhi was shot. So this has been an enduring tension, and one of the things that we can say is that internal parochialism, this sort of imposition of this Hindutva, uh, really rigid Hindu nationalist worldview on all persons, is uh, for many people as, as threatening as uh, external neo-imperialism would be. The 1950 Constitution, I think it, uh, it's useful again to look at some of the critiques on Ben Kirchhoff, because he borrowed, he was a legal scholar, he borrowed from uh, as many constitutions as he thought were useful. So he looked at uh, you know, so, some documents dealing with Ireland's uh, relationship with Britain. He looked at the US Constitution. He looked at uh, you know, French documents. Um, anything he could get his hands on, he said, you know, there's no shame in borrowing. If we find a good idea, let's use it. Um, and for him, it was always about this establishing the recognition of equal political standing, moral equality. The BJP at the time, or the, the Hindu nationalists, um, and this was long before there was a BJP, uh, said famously, there's a famous uh, quote in a newspaper, there is nothing Bharatiya about it. There's nothing Indian, nothing Hindu about this constitution. Uh, this person said, um, Bedkar should have, you know, we've got this ancient source of Hindu doctrine of laws from Manu, the Manu Smriti, the Book of Manu, that Ambedkar could have been drawing from instead of all these Western constitutions. And uh, he didn't. So there's nothing indigenous about this, um, about this document. And Ambedkar's response was that uh, first, um, you'll never have a system that's, that's ideologically neutral and he said, a secular constitution was needed to ensure fair treatment for all groups, especially those who were historically oppressed by people such as Manu. So um, Ambedkar wrote at great length on the laws of Manu because um, for him, it, it symbolized all that was oppressive about the Hindu caste system. So if a, an untouchable sits on a seat, so this is a quotation from him, he's quoting the book, sits on a seat that belongs to a higher caste person, the, the untouchable's buttocks should be cut off. Um, if their hand offends the higher caste person, that hand should be cut off. Those sorts of things. And Becker said, this is, this is the spirit of the laws of Maya, and this is what we're opposing. Uh, and this is why we need a secular constitution that allows for all to come in. So I would, I would reinforce that no system is culturally or ideological, ideologically neutral. They all have roots. Um, the more open to input, exchange, and challenge, the more the roots can be revealed, highlighted, made visible, challenged, if people think they need to be. And the more it should enable highlighting and resisting objectionable, objectionable parochialism in all its forms. Um, so I would say that that gives us additional reason to want to have those additional venues where such challenges can be made. And just more generally, in, in response to the first critique, um, a lot of critics of cosmopolitanism will say it demands first order impartiality, family mem even family members. You know, if, you, if you've got a duty to your child, it's because there's some global duty and you have to justify any special attention you give to your baby according to that global duty. Um, and Nussbaum made a, made a version of that argument actually in her early cosmopolitan work. Um, but that, that just doesn't really hold up. There's no reason we can't give special attention to our own family members um, in a global context in the same way we presume must be justifiable in a national context. Now, there are lots of caveats. There are lots of ways in which family partiality is limited. You know, um, there are rules on nepotism um, in many, in many legal contexts. Yeah. <laughs> All right. before, before 2016, there were rules on nepotism. And um, one of the things I pointed out was that institutional global citizenship actually enables further challenges uh, based on the importance of family attachments. So when a government starts separating families at the border and caging the children, including some so young that they don't even know their parents when they're reunited with them, um, that's the kind of thing that could be challenged. Now, it's been challenged in domestic courts, but we, if the, if the inter-American system were stronger, if there were global courts, etc., it would provide additional venues of input and challenge, and um, the U.S. government would not be able to act so much like the final judgments in its own case. Okay, and then very briefly, advancing alternatives. Um, I, I don't, this book is all about uh, dealing with these diversity critiques, which I think are important, I think deserve uh, 300 pages or so. So I don't spend a lot of time in this book. Uh, 
talking about how we get to this kind of system possibly, especially from the place we are now. But I, I discussed some of the things that we need to think about. So the next book is centrally about this. That's already underway. I'm already writing, writing some things on that and doing some field research at some of the regional organizations. So again, it's an instrumental approach. The ultimate aim is to advance the protection of the most fundamental rights categories and also to advance the further equitable specification of rights within those categories. So to enable as, broad as, as broadly as possible the kind of input and challenge mechanisms on rights specifications, on whether there should be more free movement, on whether there should be more cross-state, uh, trans-state distribution, et cetera. Um, and also by promoting elements of global citizenship. So this is, uh, this is nothing more than uh, you know, Kimberly Hutchings and, and Carol and some of her work, I think, has been, has been speaking about it in terms of challenging the views that would oppose global citizenship, would oppose cosmopolitanism, um, would oppose transnational solidarities, uh, the nativist sovereignty claims that are so prominent these days, um, and also assuming rights-oriented duties critically, this is another element, and then supporting strong multilateralism and international organizations. Nothing very bold in that sort of thing, but especially in this time when democracy has receded, according to Freedom House, for 13 consecutive years, um, we've got some ground to make up before we can begin thinking about being ambitious again. So obviously, uh, if, you're, if you're really talking about uh, establishing regional dem democracy and, and concrete global citizenship, in some ways we're very far, in some ways we're closer than we think. Uh, Mercosur in uh, South America uh, already has a, um, a regional residency agreement that covers every country. Uh, you might think that with all the Venezuelans fleeing their country right now, it's creating a massive crisis, that walls are going up all over South America. And actually it's been a bit of a different response. I'm not going to say it's a, it's a perfect response, but it's certainly different than what we see in the, on the North American border, US, US and Mexico. Um, so, and they're developing a, a regional global citizenship statute. Mercosur is not a strong regional organization along the lines of the European Union, but it's made some real significant strides there, I think. So, we're far away from this kind of institutional global citizenship, but in some ways, um, these projects have been ongoing. You know, what is the UN but a project in trying to establish some sort of regional citizen or a global citizenship? or at least promoting an ethic of global citizenship, um, trying to be better than the League of Nations did, falling short, of course, in, in many, many ways because the system is still so dominated by states. And then finally, um, we could look at supporting forms of regional integration and democratization. In the interest of time, I won't talk about the second case study, which was Brexit. So I spent um, the month of November 2015 talking to members of the United Kingdom Independence Party, which was one of the real motive forces pushing the conservatives uh, more to the right on immigration, more to the restrictions position, and really, at the end of the day, pushing uh, David Cameron to say, okay, we'll have a referendum on uh, EU membership. And he thought very much that it would go like the one in 1975, where there was strong support for the European Union, and we could get on with the business of being members of the European Union. Well, as we all know, it didn't work out that way in 2016, and it's still not clear what's going to happen. It doesn't look very good. But, but I wanted to talk to the UKIP uh, folks about their views on why democracy needs to be based in the nation. So they, um, many of them quote, uh, well, some of, them, uh, some of the leaders will quote John Stuart Mill you know, on some of the things he said about the importance of fellow feeling. I'll say, you see, you need that. Um, Britain feels like one nation. And then in the same breath, they'll almost always say, well, of course, you've got the Scots and you know, the English and the Welsh and uh, you know, Northern Ireland, but we're one nation. Um, so you know, very quickly, these arguments begin to deconstruct themselves. And what I wanted to do was talk to them and see what their claims were. And, um, you know, many of them sounded like uh, a lot of the sort of nationally oriented political fears. David Miller was, was very present in spirit, not in name. Um, so I, I engaged those in the last chapter. And I also look at Turkey, which um, became an appropriate case study because you kept, kept using Turkey as um, the specter to scare people into Brexit. They were saying, you know, Nigel Farage, the leader, pictured here, uh, said repeatedly, it's madness to stay in the European Union because Turkey will be in soon and our borders will be open. 
you know, and, and what's usually left unsaid, not always, is that Turkey is, um, you know, quite a strong majority Muslim. So the idea is that we'll be overrun by Muslims taking advantage of free movement. Our country won't be ours anymore. We want our country back. We must vote to leave. So it was very interesting to hear their views, to engage them, and then to go be in the streets with um, some of the Turkish activists in the 2013 Gezi Park demonstrations. I just happened to schedule my trip for when there were massive nationwide demonstrations. So that was uh, that was very interesting. You know, the tear gas and the water cannons and the people throwing rocks and, and you know people offering very articulate um, analyses of uh, the way their government was going and their fading hopes for European Union accession, which many people uh, previously saw as uh, being a route to locking in some of the democratization that, that had been happening, some of the um, moves toward uh, a, a more of a constitutional democracy, let's say. Okay, so the conclusion. Overall, the book looks at arrogance objections lodged against cosmopolitanism, and the claim I'm, I developed throughout the book is that such charges should be answerable through an emphasis on institutional cosmopolitanism, focused on promoting equal political standing for individuals, openness to dialogue and exchange. It's not a deliberative democracy proposal. I should emphasize that. Um, and I don't uh, challenge deliberative democracy. I don't dismiss it. Um, I just see a lot of really smart people, uh, some say, no, we, we've got some real value. We found some real value uh, to the deliberation experiments. We think they're scalable. We think they can be done on a national level. And other really smart people who are sympathetic to deliberation would say, no, that's the wrong model. We really can't go there. So as far as I can tell, uh, the, the jury's out enough to want to say that um, deliberation should be a real feature of this model. And I may decide later on, with input from folks like you, that that's the wrong way to go. That in the next book, I really should emphasize certain forms of deliberation. But, um, but for now, it's input, uh, which is both aggregative input, but also publicity uh, mechanisms, mechanisms of exchange that are not face-to-face -face deliberation, but being able to push your claims in broader venues, and then challenges. Challenges to an ombuds office, such as you have in the European Union, Mercosur, some other places, formal legal challenges, which we have in regional, regional systems all around the world, etc. And arrogance is a more essential feature of state sovereignty, which I've argued. So all of this, I would say, should reinforce reason to problematize firm claims for sovereignty, um, to view it as a political vice, not a set of virtues. Um, when someone says, I am a patriot, when someone says, USA, 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 um, probably the stance we should adopt is, well, let's, let's scale that back a little bit, because um, uh, patriotism in a system like the one we have um, begins to look a bit more like recalcitrance. It begins to look a bit more like arrogance. And um, while cosmopolitanism is a much harder disposition to adopt, um, it's one that I think is worth working on, uh, that, that disposition of political humility. Okay, and just to reinforce the institutional alternative, by no means guarantees just outcomes. It could promote more equal political standing amongst individuals across states, multiplying avenues for input, creating more mechanisms of challenge. Again, instrumental, incremental if you like, probably not ambitious enough for some people, but I think this is a long road. You know, in, in most countries, it takes 80 years, or it took an 80-year struggle to get women the vote, to get African Americans the vote. Um, these things take a lot of time, they take a lot of uh, people's lives dedicated to them, and we've already had some inspiring figures, so I think there's a lot of work ahead of us to do. Um, the immediate work to be done, though, challenging these nativist trends in domestic policy in the way many people are doing right now, and renewing support for a rights-based, rules-based order, the universal periodic review system from which the Trump administration has, in essence, removed itself, um, has been very reluctant to uh, enable any oversight under the existing mechanisms. Okay, and then related future work, last slide. The next book, tentatively titled Possibilities for Global Political Community. I've actually been working on that for some time. It's simply an extension of this book where we look at um, how we might problematize some of the norms that are dominant right now, how we might move incrementally towards some of these things, uh, what I've been saying. So it's a norms framework, norm development, institutional creation, and, and trying to go beyond implementation of existing norms, creating space for 
new norms and implementation. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, I found very informative about, uh, I guess, the early writing of the Indian Constitution. But um, my question is, you give like a lot of normative reasons on why we should want to move to, I guess, these cosmopolitan institutional models. But what would be like the prudential reason why a place like the U.S. or China or Russia or something would have any interest in giving up sovereignty, right, to these sort of uh, inter international institutions? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a good question because you framed it in a way that um, objectors to this government objectors often frame it. Um, why should we give up sovereignty? Um, well, the easy answer there is there are a lot of questions on our very near horizon uh, that can't be solved by a single nation state. You now, climate change is the obvious one. Uh, so if you really wanted a solution to climate change that could hold, that could really stave off what appears to be a global disaster of some, of some magnitude, um, you would need institutions capable of actually promoting collective so, to, to just a quick follow-up, though. So, if we're going with climate change potentially as an issue, I don't think it's un. It's just it seems within the realm of possibility a state like China or something be like, we're just going to do geoengineering. We're not going to engage with the world on decision making. We're just going to put sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, right? We're going to solve it. We figured out it's better for our country. Screw that the monsoons break down and India has widespread starvation now, but. It's better for us, right? And the country could like potentially make that decision. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's actually a really good encapsulation of the challenges before the cosmopolitan. And I don't make a collective action argument. I think there are collective action arguments to be made. Um, I don't think it's quite as easy as you suggest um, that China's going to have geoengineering within the next few years that'll solve the problem for them, uh, right? I sure. do think you're absolutely right that countries like the United States, especially under the current administration, are going to say, you know what, we've got money to build walls. We've got money to repair Houston next time it floods, um, but not San Juan. Um, you know, we, uh, we're not going to worry about that. The cosmopolitan's task, part of that task, is problematizing that, challenging that idea, and challenging the broader ideas that say, um, we are a nation state, we take care of our own. Um, you know, it's those who defend the nation state. So I've heard Leif Weinar, for example, speak very eloquently about this. Next speaker. Oh, <laughs> we're all in the tribe. Um, actually, he's not in my tribe, but he's very smart and he's very good. Um, and he's also a friend. Uh, but uh, I've heard him talk about the great achievements of the state system. And if there is a great achievement of the state system, I think there are. It's that it has enabled humans to live together in much larger groups. The fact that there is a thing called China uh, when it's composed of so many linguistic groups, so many ethnic and religious groups, many of whom are being uh, tamped down by the Chinese government and have been for some time, but that we can think of ourselves as a unit of 325 million Americans seems to imply um, that, uh, I mean, I, I haven't seen a good argument for why there's some bright line drawn around what we call nation states that should preclude us from going a little larger. And I think China, for some time, has been the best argument for thinking that other states probably will ultimately respond by turning back to forms of regional integration. Because it was the rise of the European Union um, that made the US more receptive to Mexico when it came knocking about NAFTA. And Trump's been very hostile to that, but he hasn't really found a way to kill NAFTA. He's just sort of renamed it. So, so I, this is really interesting. Thank you for, for your presentation. Um, as I was listening to you, though, it seemed like the thrust of the argument, at least as, as kind of demonstrated in your cases, was um, not so much about the diversity objections or the arrogance objections against a moral cosmopolitan approach, but rather, um, or, or rather how global citizenship addresses those, but rather how global citizenship addresses actually the arrogance of nationalism or the, the arrogance of states, as you say. In other words, it's it's more about global citizenship um, addressing or revolving or resolving, excuse me, arrogance that expresses itself domestically. Um, so it's it's domestic elements turning to the universal sphere to revise and reform and and sort of um, shape the domestic to shape their their bounded sphere. Um, is there some sense in which your argument is also about 
the arrogance of moral cosmopolitanism itself, because I think the knock against cosmopolitanism often is that itself, its own content and the institutions that it erects to promote its moral, you know, framework, that's what's arrogant and not open to the contributions of the particular and the domestic. And, um, yeah, you started with that, but I felt what happened was you went, you went in the direction of actually national arrogance, not cosmopolitan arrogance. So I'm wondering if there's also a thread in the argument that addresses mm -hmm. that, that arrogance of cosmopolitan itself, uh, uh, cosmopolitanism itself. Yeah, no, that, that's a really good point to raise. Um, one of the risks of trying to present, uh, you know, a nine-chapter book uh, in one talk. So uh, you're right. I did give emphasis to the, the arrogance of states and that sort of thing. But uh, many of the chapters are devoted to the, the actual critiques. So people like Bernard Yak, who's, who's arguing against cosmopolitanism specifically as arrogant, and I'm, I'm engaging his arguments. Uh, Martha Nussbaum's arguments that um, cosmopolitanism is arrogant in wanting to impose on the entire world a single set of values. Um, and Simon Caney has made uh, much the same argument about the instrumental kind of approach that I take, because an instrumental approach says there are certain values that should be promoted for everyone, there are certain rights that uh, should be protected for everyone. And um, one of the ways in which I think it's important to talk about, so there are two things. Um, I think potentially oppressed minorities, potentially oppressed individuals must always have an avenue of appeal where they can offer their claims and their challenges. We must never simply say, oh, that's how they do it. That's, that's the Hindu way of life. That's what Mr. Modi, the Prime Minister, tells us. Who are we to, um, to engage in that, to barge in there? Um, well, we're no one, but Ambedkar is someone within that context who's making very eloquent arguments. And I think it's, it's possible, um, in most cases, to hear these sorts of claims. And there's an obligation, I think, on people who are not part of the context to say, well, wait a minute, why, why, are, why are you not listening to those folks? Uh, United States, why are you um, oppressing people who've been embedded here for 30 years? And why are you turfing out you know, people who are pillars of their community just because they don't happen to have authorized status? Those sorts of things. So for me, it's always important to have those mechanisms of challenge. But then I do, in the book, deal uh, in a very fine-grained manner, I try to, uh, with the very specific critiques. And Nussbaum's critique, for example, um, is, uh, is that uh, cosmopolitanism has this idea of how we should live. And she goes back to the Stoics, and we should impose that. And for her, the big problem is that it rejects these personal attachments. And uh, so one of the responses is, is what I offered very briefly, which is that it doesn't have to. Um, but then also that um, the kind of Rawlsian law of people's framework, she rejects most of the conclusions Rawls draws, but she now presents her capabilities framework as freestanding in exactly the way Rawls' law of peoples is freestanding. And she'll say, that's the right way to think about it. So it, it's more a matter of engaging with each of the claims that are made along the way. Um, but you're right to, to point that out. Uh, sort of a related question. I mean, yeah, I'm interested in this arrogance debate. Uh, and I guess my question is somewhat, I, I guess I'm a little unclear on what the sort of alternative to arrogance is and sort of what that involves. Because I feel like at one point you sort of suggest, well, you know, it's a degree of openness to you know, the perspectives of others. Um, but I feel like that seems a little weak, maybe. So, for example, in the Dalit case, right, the Dalits bring this challenge to the Indian government, and the Indian government says, okay, well, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Right? But I feel like they can make a claim to be like, well, that wasn't arrogant, right? We listened to you, you voiced these concerns, we heard you, we, you know, we saw you, we heard your words, and now we've, but now we're going to get to do this thing. You know, it's not what you wanted, but we listened, right? So we aren't being arrogant in this case. But I feel like you do want to think they're being arrogant. So it seems like then you want to say, like, well, I, you know, we need to listen to it has to be more than open, it has to be a degree of like responsiveness. But then I wonder, then it seems almost too strong because then you could say, well, in that case, maybe it's the Dalits who are being arrogant, right? They come in, they say, we think things should be done this way. The Indian government says, no, you know, we shouldn't do this. You're embarrassing us. And then the Dalits say, well, you know, you weren't adequately responsible. Well, we're, you know, we've heard you, but now we're going to go take this to the UN and the international community, right? We've kind of run roughshod over your opposition to, you know, our, you know, you voiced these sort of complaints about our project. We don't want, you know, but that we're undeterred, right? It seems like they're not being adequately responsive. So I guess, you know, it sort of seems like who, 
how does one avoid arrogance? You know, what, what would non arrogance look like in a political context? Whatever. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> That's arrogance. Yeah. Um, you avoid er Well, uh, if they're saying, we listen to you, um, we, we've heard you, we've acted, in fact, that's exactly what they say. And the Dalit activists will say, no, you haven't fully listened to us because when I go to a police station, they won't take my report if I'm a Dalit. If, I, if, if my, my family member has been sexually assaulted by a higher caste man and I'm trying to report that, they won't take my report. If somebody's encroached on my land and it's a higher caste person, um, they won't take my report or if they take it, they'll, they won't act on it. These are the things that the activists have been documenting um, in the same way I'm that I'm did exhaustively for many years. And they've got a lot of you know, well-established programs where, you know, Dollar Watch and these sorts of things where um, they'll, they'll document, they'll actually go with people to help them file reports, there's legal aid. Um, so I think when you're, uh, you're, you're absolutely right, when you're offering arrogance claims, when you're saying you're not giving us uh, appropriate opportunities to give input, and to give challenge. Um, and I think what you're talking about is where challenge really comes into it. Because uh, what you've described is uh, in, in Button's context would be political recalcitrance. Uh, we listen to you, you know, but we got things you're to do what we want. Um, and that's when it becomes so important to have those sort of, as far as you can get them, those more neutral venues in which you can launch your claims according to established principles, you know, the, the legal model. Um, and it, it works very well often with an ombuds model, um, but many times because these issues are so fraught, and in the Indian context, what the activists will tell you is that um, the government and the courts and every, everybody's higher caste. Um, those are the people who dominate these institutions, so sometimes we're not able to get justice and sometimes we need to go to a higher level. Um, the way just these are long answers, sorry. Uh, but the way Paul DeMacher, the convener, um, explained it to me was, let's say in the village, uh, a person of a lower caste wants to get married to a person of a higher caste. Most people in the village will say, no, that's ridiculous. Uh, you can't possibly do that. Uh, that violates everything. And, and we've heard your arguments, but no, it's just not possible. He said, it's that you need to go to a higher venue. You know, and it's a familiar principle, but it's one that uh, institutionally is highly underdeveloped in the current system. So I would say that um, the more chances people have to call out what they think is arrogance and to say, this is a violation uh, because I'm not being appropriately listened to and I'm not being given a chance to challenge, the more mechanisms of challenge they have, generally, the better. Um, uh, yeah. <clears throat> no, no, personally. Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. I, I have a, a couple of link questions uh, related to the concept of humility that you uh, emphasize uh, throughout. Uh, and, and so the first question is very general and broad. Are, are you presuming that humility is a kind of universal political virtue? Uh, and then secondly, in the way you describe humility, right, you describe three components. If I followed you correctly, like in a Openness to input, uh, an assumption of equal moral standing of all individuals, and a kind of epistemic uh, humility as well. Uh, it seems like in that middle one, equal moral standing of all, uh, you've built into humility a kind of cosmopolitan premise, uh, which doesn't seem very humble in, in a certain sort of way, right? So in other words, you know, part of the claims against cosmopolitans is that they assume that we can't have a culture in which people have different status based on any number of factors, right? And this is why they're going to resist it, right? So, you know, you're, you know, uh, so I'm just kind of confused about, you know, whether humility is something specifically cosmopolitan or more general, or how this all works. Right. And I didn't present chapter three, so it's a very perspicuous question. Um, and chapter three is the one where I look at Ambedkar's own answers for why we should why we should respect moral equality. And in, in that frame, sometimes he sounds like Kant, and sometimes he very much doesn't sound like Kant. So I spend a whole chapter going over uh, his the answer to his question, the answers he offered, is why should we treat all human beings as if they're equals? Um, why should we treat them as if they have rights? Why should we be willing to sacrifice our money and sometimes even our lives to protect their rights? 
and he gives a, a very you know, complex set of answers over decades. Um, they begin with um, a call for social equality. He calls it the fiction of equality. Why should we accept the fiction of equality? Because uh, clearly, you know, some people are smarter, faster, etc. Why should we treat everyone as moral and political equals? It's a familiar question, but I think it's really interesting to go back to him and his context in which he was making these sorts of claims, where it, the, the dominant presumption was that there isn't moral equality. People have the standing they deserve based on their actions in a previous life. So in a way, he was facing the same challenge as the Mills um, when, they were, when they were writing about women's equality, as Du Bois when he was writing about equality for African Americans. But he also had the additional challenge of the doctrine of desert, of karma. And so he, he really had it cut out for him. So his, I think he makes a good, he offers us a good entree in, into your very important question because he faced those same questions uh, where people said, our culture doesn't value this kind of equality you're talking about. Um, and so he talked about uh, instrumental reasons to um, observe the fiction of equality. So an administrator, has, you know, can't possibly um, you know, look into someone's eyes and tell what their capacities are and what you know, the role they should be put in um, or what they deserve. So really, uh, to get the most for society, you want to treat everyone as a political equal. Um, so that's a, a, a very you know, Platonic kind of argument or, or you know, trace back to Plato. Um, right, why should you let women you know, engage in combat? Why should you let, let treat women as equals? Uh, but then also, he's got... Um, doctrinal and non-doctrinal arguments for equality. And I think one of the really interesting arguments that he made, so he starts with a standard argument about distinctive human capacities. You know, we're just, we're special creatures, and this, you know, goes back to the Stoics, of course, to Kant. But then he offers uh, some interesting twists on it, um, on our relation to animals. Because again, he's operating in a context where Dalits were often categorically given lower status than many animals. So for example, he led a famous protest where he burned this book, The Manasmita, and he, he led a ceremony where it was burned. And at a water tank where Dalits had dared drink from the common water source, um, thereby you know, quote unquote polluting it, and were attacked because of it. And he, what he said there was, you know, animal, any Dalit's animal can come and drink from this source, and nobody says anything. If a Dalit has a cow, the cow can drink from the source but the Dalit cannot. Um, so he had this uh, insight about ways in which Dalits were treated as if they're not distinctive members of the species. And toward the end of his career, he started blurring these lines again between humans and animals, where he's saying, yes, humans are very, very special because we have this capacity for creative living, for recognizing each other as equals, for treating each other, including each other, uh, but animals are also special in their way too. So I think um, there's a lot more to be said, but I, I do try to deal with it, and I do try to say it's not just a stipulation. We have to establish moral equality, and I think a lot of people have been raising your challenge in, in some pretty important ways. I think. Well, there's also a question of who speaks for the culture, though, mm -hmm. to contest the idea that uh, the culture which was established for the benefit of the upper class isn't mm -hmm. necessarily one thing and definitive and so forth. That would be a, a complementary strategy. Uh, yes. <clears throat> yeah, I think my question is sort of been partly covered, but I was interested in the question of kind of grounded cosmopolitanism. I found a lot of work looking at, um, as an anthropologist, looking at women's rights claims. And one of the complexities that came up was actually seeing that so many kinds of claims to rights were actually being posed as human rights, clearly, in a sense, looking for a cosmopolitan global imaginary to tie their notions to, but in the sense, as you quite rightly pointed out, quite often combated precisely for those very reasons. You know, the state saying they're external. But I've been very interested in Islamic feminisms in Southeast Asia who, who sort of put forward notions of culturally mediated notions of rights that therefore allow you to make these much more limited claims on the state that this is something that's inherent in a kind of rave by culture. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about rarefication here, obviously. <laughs> but I mean, it seems to seems interesting that whole thing around grounded cosmopolitanism against the failures of the larger. I mean, if you think of the UN failures, everybody can document those, can't they? The International Criminal Court doesn't work, and you bring say, Africans into, into the court, and nobody else gets dragged before it. Um, failures of peacekeeping and so on. 
Yes, and um, that's one of the reasons I find uh, going out there and talk to people is so invaluable. And, and since you're an anthropologist, I will I will offer my caveat. I, I don't do ethnography. <laughs> I don't I don't claim to be finding any sort of authentic voice on the part of individuals. I'm just looking for sets of normative claims that people are offering. And you're right. Um, the the Dalit human rights um, have an interesting caveat in their in their documents and in their rhetoric, which is that um, we are not pushing a highly individualistic line on human rights. We think uh, community embeddedness is very, very important. And what Paul DeVacher said to me, uh, so I had, um, I've been trying to observe uh, good uh, grounded practice, good engaged practice, and send him drafts, and send some other people drafts who have been speaking to him. And uh, once I, I went and met him, you know, a third or fourth time, and he had to sit me down because he was very concerned about my draft. And he said, you know, I think you're getting some things wrong here. What you must do is present us as people of the community, people of the soil. Um, we sweated and we toiled here, and then, and that's why we've got the standing to make these kinds of claims. We're not you know, making these highly individualistic claims. Um, and I don't, I don't claim to have solved any of those issues. Um, I'm very aware of them, but you're, you're right to bring them up. And then I think one more quick thing, uh, the, the really challenging um, issue that's raised by people making claims uh, for um, cultures is how far uh, can one justifiably insist that people have the right to choose to do otherwise. So if you've got this very nuanced um, sense of women's rights within Islam, and I had a, a PhD student who did a um, a thesis on Islamic distributive justice, and um, do they have the right to apostasy? Do they have the right, you know, and, and should that be um, confirmed for them by political institutions? I think it's very complex. Uh, so maybe I can ask a sort of a follow-up to an earlier question about the arrogance of moral cosmopolitanism. Are you at all worried about just the dangers of concentrated cosmopolitan <laughs> institutionalism? And for, for me, it's not a hypothetical, but it's that um, I've read it about how sort of the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation have really influenced the UN the education agenda. And they're sort of taking a neoliberal education model to scale. And so, um, and so are you at all worried about sort of these incredibly arrogant, centralized, <laughs> uh, centralized planners sort of using these sort of international institutions for, I don't know, neoliberal ends? Yes, um, and I think the Gates Foundation is a good example because the way the current system is structured, the UN is starving for funds, right? So when someone with, what's he at, 50 billion, something like that, when, when he can just you know, start doing that and, and, and exert his influence in the way that the United States can exert its influence because it's still 22% of the dues, um, I think that kind of system is prone a little bit more to those sorts of things. And there's no way that someone like you can join with like-minded people and petition an ombuds um, you know, uh, office or file a legal challenge that would actually have teeth. Um, so I would actually say that uh, the kind of system I'm talking about, insofar as it might ever be feasible, would help to better address those sorts of things. Because Ambedkar dealt with this in, uh, in terms of the Adivasis, the tribal people. And uh, he's been criticized. Um, I think he did a lot better than Kant did. Uh, because Kant basically rejected global democracy by one reading. Uh, he, he argued for a, conf a weak confederation globally because he didn't think um, the non-white peoples were up to being full citizens uh, globally. And that's, uh, that's David Harvey's reading there. Or, um, I think that's his. And uh, I, think it's, I think it's very important. Ambedkar had some of the same challenges of how to integrate the tribal peoples into Indian society, and he insisted that they be full citizens um, and protected from exploitation. Now, early on, that meant that uh, there were special laws limiting what they were able to do with property, limiting you know, or the land, limiting what other people were able to do, but in terms of protecting them against exploitation. So there are always those powerful forces out there who want to drive the tribal peoples off the land and cut down the trees and, and use the land for their own. And the institutions that Ambedkar insisted on having, the strong legal review and that sort of thing, uh, were meant to be protection for vulnerable peoples like that. And I think what you're talking about is um, 
a system that's vulnerable to the influence of other people. I want to ask something first, um, just and then we'll continue. Um, just sort of, what do you think the role of transnational social movements is in this picture? Because you seem to be thinking institutionally, uh, and then the, the social movements you mentioned are all national, uh, but also like um, the institutional framework that you just pointed to here, I know you've written about it elsewhere in broader terms, but it, it just seems like a legal framework of opportunities to um, a forum for appeal or something like that. But anyway, what is the relation between the transnational social movements, which are less objectionable, presumably from the standpoint of humility, since the leadership would be those who are, uh, um, you know, who are most concerned or aggrieved about a particular situation, and other people are taking their lead from them and acting in support of them, thinking transnational solidarity movements of, of that sort. Um, not not the alleviating suffering, but the ones where they're you know working towards justice. So what is the relation between that and the institutional framework? You don't really have to choose. You could have both, but I'm just wondering how you're thinking about that. No, if, if we have hope in these dark times, and I think we do, um, the, the very movements you're talking about, I think, are a source of hope, uh, a, a motive source of advancing um, forms of global citizenship, if you like. And the 2010 book was all about that. So it, it dealt a bit with the institutional framework, but it was, uh, it was really focused on people who um, seemed to me to be enacting important practices of global citizenship extending protections to those who didn't share their citizenship. So for every one of those civilian border patrollers who had the pistol strapped on and the binoculars and everything, you'd have four or five humanitarian patrollers out in the same desert looking for people who'd gotten in trouble. And I did a lot of participant observer work with them where I would go out as well and just do the work alongside them. Um, and I think uh, they're very, very important, but they're not the only um, non-state actors who are very important. I think unauthorized migrants and people making uh, asylum claims are some of the most important actors in our current system because they... Like Robin Salakadis argued here. Ah, they, they keep the issue in the foreground. So I spent a whole chapter in the, in the previous book talking about how unauthorized migration should be framed as, as a form of global conscientious evasion um, with the power to actually keep foregrounding these yeah. issues yeah. and, and uh, keep pushing these issues. He's calling it, you know, civil disobedience. Oh, I, I used to, uh, well, I, I call it, I say it's in a civil disobedience framework, but it sort of fits conscientious invasion because they don't report, they well, don't better report get your book out before it is, because yeah. it's writing. Well, no, no, 2010 book, chapter 5. I'll, oh, okay, I'll, okay. I'll, <laughs> I'll send you a copy of it. Oh. Well, no? Um, yeah, it's kind of uh, been answered, but like, I'll just check. Maybe uh, first, thanks very much for the talk. Um, so my my worry throughout was was that the examples were perhaps kind of easy examples, um, right? If if the people making claims against international institutions are Tony Abbott and UKIP and the BJP, then being skeptical of those claims or persuading people to be skeptical of those claims isn't too hard. Uh, these are the bad guys. Um, uh, and I was just wondering what you had to say about about the, the maybe the, the tougher cases where it looks like in, international institutions are really responsible for the exploitation of uh, of countries in the global south, of so people in in uh, Spain and, and Greece with Podemos and Syriza who, who, who are, uh, you know would would say that that a uh, transnational organisation came in and prevented them from implementing from that. Uh, uh, the policies that would have been good policies that were, were voted on by, by the people that, that affect and stuff like that. And I, I guess the, the answer will be that these, these are the wrong international institutions or something like that. But I, I no, that's a, that's a really important question. Actually, that's a really rich question. It raises a lot of important issues. Um, I've got a, a, a good friend uh, who I used to work with at the University of Birmingham in the UK, and we spent many, a, many an hour in the pub uh, arguing over these kinds of issues. And his claim was always um, that the EU is ineluctably a neoliberal institution, and it can't be anything else. If that's the case, then we're sunk. Um, and if that's the only kind of institutional integration we can have above the state, then we're sunk. Um, 
And my counter, the, the arguments I would always mount against that or try to uh, over many years, was that um, it may have a neoliberal character, but I think there are reasons to think that there's nothing inherent to political institutions that they must be neoliberal. Because if you look at many of our nation states, they're neoliberal. You know, when the, when the sort of economic right is in charge, um, they tend to take on the, you know, austerity and, and cut back on social services. Then when the left is in charge, they look different. Now, um, does the EU need a lot of reform? Indeed, indeed. I think it's, it's, had its, it's having its reckoning. And uh, so we'll see whether uh, some of these different ideas might now have their day. Uh, but I think you, you raise an important question. It's an empirical question. It needs investigation. So that's one of the things I'll try. I'll probably just lean on really smart people uh, to help me sort through that. And then your other question was, aren't these just, isn't it really easy to, to hold up Tony Abbott? Because, uh, you know, nobody, nobody really likes Tony Abbott very much. Um, and uh, I, I've, been, I've been in Australia for almost five years, so I, I think I'm allowed to say that now. <laughs> uh, you know, UKIP is, um, for all the influence it's been able to have, it's never had huge electoral success. It's still kind of a fringe group, even though they pulled the Tories much closer to their position. Uh, so one of the things I would say in response is that sometimes it's easiest to see where the light is best. Uh, so these folks shine a bright light on those kinds of really nativist, nationalist arguments. And I think uh, they're also the ones who are winning right now. So if you want to talk to people who are both pushing these arguments and also pushing them very successfully, I think then the BJP, which won uh, the biggest majority in recent memory, an outright majority, um, it's very important to talk to them. So I, I, I speak to this point a little bit in the book. And then I think once you've dealt with that sort of easier case, then you, a lot of the same uh, arguments that you make there are ap applicable to sort of more moderate cases. Um, but I actually take a, a fairly firm line. I, I don't think um, even a, a moderate form of nationalism, if it involves the wholesale exclusion of, let's say, migrants, etc., is really justifiable. Two more questions? Yeah, I mean, thank you for this, because I'm currently doing my thesis on this topic, cosmopolitan democracy. So um, I recently looked into David Hill and his piece on Kent's professional, Kent's uh, piece, uh, as well as uh, David Ajibo from Italy, who was uh, discussing the internal levers and uh, external levers in which we can achieve uh, global democracy. Mm -hmm. So my issue was that while I was looking at these, because part of the reason why I did this was to reevaluate the global economic system itself, uh, due to the fact that it's, uh, as you've discussed, neoliberal in, in policy. So my issue is that I have not seen any kind of discussion on the reevaluation of the global economic system, so discussing mm -hmm. global, uh, uh, economic globalism itself. So I just wanted to know your take on this while discussing mm -hmm. cosmopolitan. So, uh, so if I if I spoke to social democracy on the global level, would that kind of speak to what you're asking about? Yes. Okay. So, so, uh, so I would point you to Held's uh, 2004 book, which is is framed as um, a social democracy for the global level. Um, so have you had global a chance? Global covenant. Book? Yeah, global covenant. Yeah. Okay. Have you had a chance to to look at that one? No, no, yeah. Okay. So it's, it's framed as a cosmopolitan Democrat's response to the Washington Consensus, this neoliberal consensus that's held sway in various guises for a long time now. Uh, and I think uh, I think that's an important statement. Um, uh, Held taught us a whole lot. He recently passed away. Um, he taught us a whole lot about um, you know the ins and outs of, of how we might think about cosmopolitan democracy. I think his all affected frame runs into some, some issues that you might consider. Uh, so I take, again, a more instrumental frame uh, on that. And, and if you want to get my card, I'd be happy to send you some of the sources. Not, not that I've written them. You yes. know, the other, other people have. Because um, there's, there's been a lot said. Uh, one of the things you might uh, consider looking into is the campaign for a UN parliamentary assembly, uh, which is sort of near term, uh, trying to get uh, basically a second chamber, but uh, even, even more limited than that uh, to start off with. Um, but I think uh, what you're pointing at is really important, and it might not surprise you to learn that I lean on an argument of Ambedkar <laughs> on, uh, he talks about the soul of democracy. So um, democracy has been treated as one person, one vote. Uh, 
but the soul of democracy is much more about um, treating people as the, um, the distinctively special beings they are and ensuring that they have economic opportunities as well, so economic democracy. Well, I, I can't be the only one room not to ask a question, so, but we can talk about it upstairs. Uh, my question is exactly what you're talking about. You're talking about le universal le uh, legal rights, uh, political rights, uh, but most of the arguments that might be here in advance for Brexit or for strong borders and sovereign control are economic. Now, do you think that those economic arguments, the protection of local economies and so forth, are actually disguises for cultural and other kinds of political control? Or do you think they're inexorably mixed? Mm -hmm. Or do you think that the cultural arguments are really mm -hmm. driven by economic control? and that the caste systems and other kinds of systems are really just economic enforcement of, 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 of access to capital, to income flows and so forth. Uh, which one, I, I haven't heard you talk about economics, mm -hmm. yet in every example you're given, there's an economic shadow mm -hmm. that is driving those decisions. Yeah, I, I mentioned a little bit, um, there's a, an economist who got out the rat who's um, written a, a lot about the economics of the caste system and how it is advantageous and, and how India would do so much better by uh, unblocking people from economic opportunity based on caste. But I'll speak to Brexit, um, because what you raise is really interesting. It was sold as an economic benefit yeah. to Britain. Um, there, there's no economic benefit oh, it's, that it's anyone can find. Those, those numbers on the side of the bus next to Nigel Farage's head were completely made up, and, and they've acknowledged as much in, in some cases. Uh, and and you, made, you just made me realize that in every interview I did, no one put forth the economic argument. No UKIP person, not, not their ministers, of the, members of the European Parliament, not the rank and file members in Leicestershire, um, not a single one. It's always about um, Britain is an English well, uh, England is an English cultural, nation. Yeah. Cultural, and cultural and nation. And you've got to feel connected to each other by national sentiment to do democracy. No, basically but democracy. what does he use except the suspension of economic control mechanisms on physical boundaries? I mean, you're, you're, you're basically, that's the deal. Right? Mm -hmm. There's a joint checking account that's trying to serve as a, a, you know, some kind of cultural uh, amelioration. It's not mm -hmm. working. So. Well, I think we're about to see the uh, economic argument for the EU play out on a very big stage when we've got you know those trucks backed up for 30 miles waiting to cross the channel. I can't sort of, I can't wait to see what happens. Oh, sure. I can. <laughs> I, I really got fond of Britain, and it's not going to be good. It's not going to be good. The whole world is looking to it as an example of what nationalism, protectionism could result in, mm. in, a, in a bad outcome. But the cosmopolitan, I think, has to pay really close attention to the kind of arguments that are being made and the kind of rhetoric that leaders are able to use to get the vote out. Because at the end of the day, it was 52 to 48 in favor of leave. Yeah. Now, you can say what you want, but it's, it's a significant Well, issue. economics has the appearance of neutrality, mm. which is why I think it's a disguise. OK, so uh, we're going to continue upstairs and proceed to uh, over three. And turn the <laughs>